I would like to uh, bring up our main dish, as it were. Uh, could we have some music and Mark to share? How about a round of applause? So we're going to talk. We're just going to have a little fireside conversation and, and chat. Um, uh, we're, we're gonna, obviously, we'll talk a bit about your, your career as a baseball player, but also what, how did that prepare you for? What, what analogs, comparisons might there be between being a, an elite, top-tier professional baseball player and then in the business world as you are now? So we'll move in and out of those contexts, trying to figure out how these two uh, Bibles, uh, Bibles relate. Um, but maybe it's good to start, start in the beginning. You, you weren't built with, born with a silver spoon in your mouth, were you? Tell me a bit about your family, big, uh, big family. Yeah, I grew up uh, just, out, just outside of Baltimore, Maryland, uh, uh, kind of a, a suburb of Baltimore, Washington, Severna Park. And, you know, very middle class, you know, just very comfortable upbringing, but um, had to work for everything. You know, my dad was, uh, you know, kind of a tough dad, but fair. Uh, the, when the hair got long, he'd pull it a little bit. <laughs> or when the shirt was untucked on the baseball field, he'd, you know, tap, on, tap me on the shoulder. And so my dad really kind of set me up for, for the type of man that I wanted to be. And my mom, growing up, wow, what a sweetheart. Uh, you know, she's in heaven now and, and mm. looking down on me tonight. But she was uh, raised Roman Catholic, the oldest uh, daughter of eight kids, uh, just outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Her dad, my grandfather, uh, served during World War II and worked mm. in the steel mills. Wow. So I think you can kind of see the type of parents I had, hardworking Nothing was ever given to me, and, and that was one of the main reasons that I worked so hard as an athlete growing up. Yeah, and and if you don't mind, if it's too personal, don't go there. But your faith story. So, uh, Catholic family. Did you was it a family that's sort of nominally Catholic, or was Mass a central part of your your routine? Yeah, Mass was essential. We were actually just talking about it at our, at our table tonight. It's like you know, did you enjoy going to Mass as a kid? No. <laughs> I mean, let's be honest. Father, I love you. Father, I love you. But as a kid, it's because mom and dad pulled pulled me to mass. But as I got older, uh, you realize how important it was. Yeah. Um, I made the choice to go to an all-boys Catholic high school. Um, it sounds crazy as a 14-year-old saying I'm going to go to an all-boys high right. school, but I did it because uh, I did want and need a little bit of spiritual guidance. Mm -hmm. My parents, uh, my dad really didn't grow up very religious, right. you know, not really going to church a lot, but my mom was the one that brought him in mm -hmm. and, and really showed him how important going to church was and, and your relationship with Jesus Christ. My dad and my older sister, who's three years older than me, actually got confirmed at the same time. Really? So how cool is that, that, wow. um, you know, growing up, I got to see my dad make that journey. Uh, and, and Lee, my beautiful wife, who is the sweetest person in the world. Here, here, let's Michael do us F. applaud again. <laughs> um, so so Matt just recently Matt confirmed got something well. right. He huh? did, he did, he did. We're, we're going to give him some credit for that. But she was recently confirmed. Well, congratulations. Absolutely, yeah. So my wife grew up uh, Southern Baptist in Georgia. We, we met at, at Georgia Tech. And <laughs> yeah, it is, to me, whatever gets you to Jesus Christ, right? You know, so, so whether you're Catholic, whether you're Protestant, whatever it is, you know, it's that personal relationship yeah. that um, my Catholic background and then meeting Lee in college and meeting friends from the South just helped me, you know, help bring me closer to God. Right. Because to the extent we can generalize, there are some parts of the country and some Christian traditions that are more vocal about, about the role of Christ in one's life. Uh, yeah. And, and, and to me, I was, when I first got to college, we had a Bible study. I had never been to a Bible study in my life. <laughs> I went to Catholic high school. Right. And we studied the Bible, but right. you know, after practice, when we you know we got a little note, hey, after practice Bible study is like, what is that? <laughs> but it's a bunch of guys, you know, eighteen to twenty-two years old, right. talking about real things, mm. talking about what you struggle with, mm. and how you can go to the Bible for some answers. Mm. Now, you also have an uncle, if I recall, who's a priest. Tell me a bit about him because he's my, played a role in your life, hasn't my he? My uncle Chuck Charles Canterna, the oldest of the eight children, <laughs> is a Catholic priest in Baltimore. And he's, he's uh, affectionately known as the street priest. The so street priest. he goes out, um, his entire life has been going out onto the streets and uh, ministering to the homeless. Hmm. And so his two main ministries are the homeless and uh, prisoners. So you talk about a man who uh, is fed by the Lord, literally fed by the Lord. There are, Lee will tell you, there's times we get together with the, fam with the family and Uncle Chuck's there. And we say, Uncle Chuck, when was the last time you ate? And he kind of goes... <laughs> I ate yesterday morning because the Lord just fills him. And, wow. and that type of spiritual guidance for me as a, as a kid and, and as a man now, um, Uncle Chuck just turned 70, uh, is so important because talk about the most humble of men. 
uh, our example of Jesus Christ, he is living that life. I mean, he yeah. is living it to a T, and uh, it's, it's great to have him in our family. Well, you know, because a lot of families don't grow up with those sort of examples or role models and so forth. I mean, has, did you meet some of the, the guys that you played ball with over the years that didn't have that and thought you were kind of crazy to uh, care about this question? Yeah, you know, I, I think as you get older and, and you start realizing that everyone isn't like you, right? You know, <laughs> I mean, you were all, all boys Catholic high school. Everyone's kind of in the same boat. Your parents sent you to this high school for a certain type of education. You're 15, you know, 14 to 18 years old, and there's not a lot of crazy things thrown mm. at you. You go to college, same thing. Everyone's there on either a baseball scholarship or is good enough to walk on to a place like Georgia Tech and all, you know, all kind of in the same boat yeah. in, in life. It wasn't until I went to the minor leagues mm. and just poof, Dominican Republic, Japan, um, Chinese Taipei, all these different countries, not mm. to mention the, the rest of our, our country, country sure. that, is, that is represented in minor league baseball and kids from all over, kids from the poorest of the poor country, the poorest of the poor uh, in the United States, mm -hmm. and kids like me that, that, that went to Catholic school and saying, hey, you going to go to church Sunday? Like, so you get to meet a lot of different people and, um, and be able to experience different, different lives. Yeah. Well, sometimes also if someone has, a, as a sociologist called a different social location, they, well, they see the world differently. And if you grow up in a poor place, you're going to read the Bible through a different lens than if you grow up in an affluent place. Uh, you know, fast forward a bit. We, we chatted about this the other day. Uh, you know, we, we live in an affluent zip code. Um, you've been financially successful in, addis in addition to on your field that's been rewarded financially. How do you, how do you think about uh, raising kids when you have a high disposable income on a high net worth? That is, that's such a great question. It's something that, that we struggle with um, as a family and um, as, as ball players when I was playing, yeah. a, lot of, a lot of my Christian brothers struggled with. But um, the way I look at it is God put everybody in the position that they're supposed to be in. It's up to us to, to minister and to be uh, you know, a good person in that position. Yeah. So if God puts you on the New York Yankees, you better be the best Christian and the best man possible on the New York Yankees. If he puts you on the street, you know, as, as, a, as a guy who's just saying, hey, love Jesus when you walk down Manhattan, hey, God's putting him there for a reason. Yeah. And, and that's the way that I've, I've kind of looked at my career. I've been blessed far beyond anything I can ever yeah. imagine. Yeah. How am I going to use those blessings yeah. to serve God? Yeah. Well, you know, and, and part of that, and, and if this is too uh, personal, uh, don't, don't go there, but if I recall when you were in high school, um, uh, one of your friends died, uh, and that impact a lot of your life. Do you mind sharing something? Absolutely. We had... Um, we had six guys in high school that were kind of did everything together. We all lived close. Uh, we played similar sports and, you know, would go to, you know, maybe carpool together, kind of do everything. We, caught, we, we were so cool. We called ourselves a six-pack, you know. <laughs> I did have a beer or two in high school. We thought we were the coolest, the coolest kids. Actually, well, that's not a bad nickname. There yeah, you go. Oh, no, we, were, we, were, yeah, we were really fun. But anyway, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, one of my friends was on his way. This is, uh, you know, during the day. It was, you know, 11 or 12 o'clock in, in, the, in the morning, and um, he was driving to, uh, to Six Flags mm -hmm. and uh, stopped on the side of the road and uh, a tractor trailer hit him Oof. and uh, and was killed at 16 years old mm. and you talk about a um, you talk about a phone call you don't want to get mm. um, and just the friends that rallied around his family mm -hmm. uh, the, the bond that we created through that and you know just kind of the idea that we're not invincible mm. and if you don't know who God is you better start looking <laughs> so you're actually thinking that back then absolutely wow. at 16 we didn't have the answers I don't sure. have the answers now, yeah. right? I'm still searching for the answers. But right. at 16, you think you're invincible and you think that everything you do, there's no consequences and, right. and whatever. And um, I think that made me grow up real fast. Hmm. Uh, and, and still to this day, we're friends with, uh, with you know, my friend Nick, his parents. Uh, we see them you know, pretty much once a year at, at either Thanksgiving or Christmas. And uh, Mr. Larry, you know, Larry and Pat Levertor used to have us over for meatballs. He's Italian. I'm half Italian, so I <laughs> uh, love my Italian food. And every Wednesday night, for, um, you know, from the time it happened our junior year through senior year of high school, we went over to Miss Pat and Mr. Larry's mm -hmm. for, for meatballs. Mm -hmm. And um, just that fellowship and helping them, it was, it was therapy for us, it was therapy for them. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I started a scholarship uh, mm -hmm. in his name for our high school. And so now 
every, every senior that that's rises from Mount St. Joe High School in, in Baltimore gets a Nick Liebertor scholarship. Mm. Um, and it's five or 10,000 bucks a year to, you know, to kind of help you get going towards yeah. college and yeah. you know, books and computer or whatever it might be. Yeah. So, um, you know, David and Cynthia, when I see you guys are doing, it's like, man, amen. That's, uh, it's just an amazing, amazing thing that you guys are doing. So um, I love it and thank you. Well, and it, it is something how what might seem like a small gesture is world changing for some people. It, it is. And I think what we have to understand is that um, everyone sees God through different eyes, right? Um, you know, I have a, a very unique perspective in life because what I did for a living, God blessed me to play baseball and I got to yeah. play baseball. Other people just need a chance, just like a little chance to yeah. get to get ahead. Yeah. And, you know, whether it's a hundred dollars or a or thousand or ten thousand to, to get you to college or, or to you know, maybe fill out an application, yeah. that's very meaningful in certain people's lives. And uh, so any chance you get to, to make a difference, uh, I take advantage of that. Mm. You know, thinking it sounds like you're growing up, played a huge role in shaping and informing who you've become as a man. And, and you talked about your uncle. He's, he's done some other special things with you. Could you tell me a bit about that? Yeah. So, you know, my Uncle Chuck, uh, you know, he was one of those guys that never wanted any credit. You know, he was, he was a guy that uh, when he went out to the poor, he didn't tell people what he was doing. He just did it. Hmm. And, you know, I'd call him up and, and, and I'd ask him for, for advice and I'd say, hey, Lee's on the phone too. Um, you know, can, you, can you talk to us? Hmm. And so Uncle Chuck for me is, is one of those guys that when you look at really who we're supposed to be, um, when you're not that man that God wants you to be, you call Uncle Chuck. Hmm. Right. And, and you know, we all do, do, need, do you mind giving me his number? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Um, he was, he was there at, at my mom's deathbed, hmm. the peace that we felt when my mom passed away, yeah. like that's powerful, you know? And, and when you don't have that faith and you don't have that connection to God and you lose somebody, um, there's a lot of darkness and there's a lot of darkness in the world, but uncle Chuck's like, you know, praise the Lord. Yeah. You know, Margie's going home. That's, hmm. that's hmm. the, the, the peace that I had during that time, and Uncle Chuck was with us every step of the way. Hmm. You know, there's, there's uh, one of the great biblical metaphors is God or Christ as, as light, and that light conquers darkness. It illuminates. It's, it, it, it's truth. It's healing. It sounds like he was that, that big light for you. Absolutely. And, and, you know, again, with all the darkness, all it takes is a little bit of light. I remember mm-hmm. we, we went to a, a, a senior retreat, and we turned off all the lights, and it was, it was probably, I think, half the senior class was in one room and half was in another room. And um, you kind of switch off what the, the message was. And they, uh, they turn off all the lights and pitch black, no windows. And then, um, but we were all given a candle, mm-hmm. you know, and then one match is struck, one candle is lit. And from that darkness, just that one little match lit up mm. the entire room. Mm. And it's like, that's God, mm. you know, but you have to go to other people. You have to light that, those candles around to your community, to your mm. brothers, to your friends, family, mm. whatever it might be. Mm. And at the end of it, the room is lit up. Hmm. And that's a, that's a great metaphor that I, I use with my kids. Yeah. I use with friends going through tough times. Yeah. And if there's a little bit of faith left in there or a little bit of, you know, a little bit of light in your life, use that to, to really get somewhere. Hmm. You know, I'm thinking of another person you mentioned once uh, when you were living and playing in Texas, if I recall, that there is a pastor in McQuitty. Yeah, and Pastor he's Andy touched McQuitty. your life. Uh, talk a bit, share some stories there, because I was struck by some of them. Uh, yeah, you know, growing up Catholic and marrying a, a, a Baptist uh, woman from South Georgia. So it's an interfaith marriage. Yeah. <laughs> we, um, we, we were always open to, uh, to new churches or, hey, there's a great priest here. Or there's a great pastor here. Or, you know, so we heard of, uh, of Pastor Annie McQuitty at Irving Bible Church. And Irving Bible Church was 15 minutes from our house. We had some friends in the neighborhood that went there. And so I said, oh, this is great. Let's go to Irving Bible. And so we went once, fell in love with it. And because of the friendships that Pastor Andy had, we went over to a, a buddy's house and had wine and cigars and talked about God. <laughs> and I'm like, man, you can talk about God anywhere. You can sit on the back porch. You can sit on the back porch and you can, you know, put your feet up and you can have a glass of wine and you can talk about how much God loves you and, mm. and what God means to you. Mm. That meant a lot because... Had like, you always sort of had more formal uh, much sense? More that formal, sort of much more formal. And stiff, yeah. Unfortunately, I think some people think of God as like a, a, like a, a buzzkill or a joy kill. It's like, <laughs> no, 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 it's the opposite. Mm. When, when, you, when you really get to know who God is and how much he loves you, it's just 
the, the most fun you can have, and it's the mm. most joyful thing you can have. Mm. And uh, so, Andy, you, know, you, you meet these people in your life that just give you a different perspective on yeah. who God is. Yeah. And it, it was very, uh, you know, very important for me. And, mm. and Andy went through a lot in his life. He, he had stage three cancer at one point. He was doing a Bible study with, like, literally three days after surgery mm. with all of the tubes and everything hooked up. And he said, I'm still doing Bible study. Mm. And it's like, man, you are, you're a stud, first of all. Uh, but, but thank you, right? Thank you for, yeah. for serving us while you're in so much pain. You know, was, I think if I recall, he also wrote a book or at least talked about how do you as a person of faith, in this case as a Christian, how do you um, engage the secular world? Uh, because if you're with people who are more or less on the same page, you know, they, they, they're fine when you use sort of religious God speak. But there are a lot of places where that's verboten. It's just not the done thing. And he helped you a bit with that. Share yes, that if you don't it's, mind. it's really easy to preach to the choir, right? You know, in, in this room, you know, I think everyone's here for a reason. You know, we all are, you know, either are, are searching for God, um, pursuing God, but know who God is. There's a lot of people that don't even know who God is. Mm-hmm. And when you meet those people, that's a challenge, mm-hmm. right? And so I think for, for me, you know, Andy wrote this book. For me is, is you know, talk about life mm-hmm. through God's eyes, right? Mm-hmm. And we, we, can't, um, we can't change the world in, in one second and say, hey, this is God. And all right, yeah, now yeah, you're healed or now yeah. you're whatever. Yeah, it's not a simple but, formula. Exactly. Yeah. But, uh, and Andy uses these words. He says, play the music of the gospel and, and have somebody ask for the words. You know, and, and that makes a lot of sense. So just play the music. Be, be a light. Be a good person. You know, uh, be joyful. Mm. And, then have, and then someone's going to ask you, why are you like this? Mm. Or you talk about God a lot. Give, give me a little bit more. Because I think one thing that's put off in this secular world is, hey, I'm Mark. Nice to meet you. Are you saved? It's like, <laughs> whoa. Like, that's, you know, and some people are good and at that. Do they mean safe at first base? <laughs> yeah. Not safe. Oh, saved. sorry. <laughs> um, and not at your first base, yeah. pal. They're out. <laughs> and, I'm not, and I'm not good at that. I, I am, yeah. um, you know, my, Lee and I talk about it all the time. Yeah. You know, you, you, have to, you have to preach the gospel every day and use words when necessary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is one of the great, uh, great uh, Catholic saints who said that as well. So when you, when you're, let's talk a bit about your, your baseball days. Uh, as Michael mentioned in the introduction that we, on your travel team, we, you would start Bible studies in enemy territory, so to speak. Yeah. I mean, did your players think, oh, Mark is just nuts? Or how, how did that work out? Um, and, and what was the fruit of that time? Yeah, we were blessed that every team I was on had a you know, 5 to 15 person group of guys that either would, would go to chapel, go to church, go to, and chapel is, you know, we play every Sunday, right? So chapel is, baseball chapel, it's a great organization. Uh, it's in the minor leagues and the major leagues. And, um, you know, for 20 minutes, you know, either before batting practice, after batting practice, depending if you're home on the road, you, you'd have a, a pastor come in and we just do a, a, a one verse, mm-hmm. you know, one verse and attack it and, and really kind of you know, pray for each other, and that is your... Sorry, is that your, you and the other team? No, no, it's, it's separate. Okay, so no, I didn't know, I didn't know. Yeah, it's separate. We're, we're checking that out, um, okay. The joke is, it's like, you didn't pray for them, did you? It's like, you're only <laughs> praying for us, right? But Home team advantage. So, so we, all, you know, we only got, you know, very difficult to go to Mass, almost all, uh, all right. day games Fine. on Sunday. You have to be there at 9 o'clock. Um, I went to bed at, at midnight or 1 o'clock the night before. Mm. So baseball chapel was very important to me. So we get that baseball chapel group together on Sunday. And I'd say, hey, guys, Tuesday in my room, room, you know, whatever, 405, whatever it is, uh, we, got, we got Bible study. Mm. And I was uh, the first probably five years, it was DVDs. And it was like, buy the book. You get all, go on the Internet and you order a uh, Bible study. After a while, you know, we started getting to getting do a little rhythm. And so I'd ask Andy Pettit or I'd ask Mariano Rivera, whoever. I'd be like, what do you guys want to tackle this week? Huh. So pick a theme first exactly. that might have been relevant, exactly. a struggle or something in their lives. And the, the power of when you're in that clubhouse and there's media around and, you know, God forbid you talk about Jesus Christ in front of the media, mm. um, you, you have to keep relatively quiet in the public spaces mm-hmm. Sure. But when you're with your, your brothers and you're sitting next to your locker, you can talk about God. And it's yeah. like, hey, we're going we're gonna to dive into that at, at Bible study. Yeah. Um, and so whatever maybe a teammate was going through, whatever something that was happening in the world at the time, we'd kind of take that theme mm. and, and attack it at Bible study that mm. week. Can you think of one that, that you put up that, um, as you look back over the years, that was just like 
hit home for you get, somehow. Um, family issues. Uh -huh. Like um, I was blessed with two parents that loved me and took me to church. Not mm -hmm. everybody is in that boat. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's almost probably more guys in baseball are not in that boat. Mm -hmm. And we talked about family a lot. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we'd have guys just start breaking down crying. This is, you know, big, strong Major League Baseball players breaking down crying because they just talked about something happened with their mom or dad or, or yeah. whatever. And they never talked about it. Nev never talked about it. And wow. so that's, that's the comfort that we wanted to bring. And that usually didn't happen in April. It was usually towards the end of the season when you, get, <laughs> you felt comfortable about who you were with. And, yeah, you had logged hours but, together. Yeah, but there yeah. were some powerful moments in those Bible studies. Uh, just kind of having guys for the first time in their lives talk about things that they were, they were going through. Yeah. You know, part of the, the, what we talk about at GLF is, is this phenomenon. How do I, how do I stay ethically fresh? How, how do I... As St. Paul would say, uh, he says, I, I do that which I know I ought not to do. So how do we not do that which I know I ought to do? And do, do you have a mantra or something that yeah. helps keep you, like when you might just be inclined to go with the guys in something that probably you shouldn't or could lead to something that you just don't want to be near? Uh, do you have a mantra yeah. or how's your faith and, help you there? Yeah, and I, and I learned it at 26. Um, mm. And again, I'm still, still learning and still searching. And uh, I think one of the things I tell everybody when I talk about my faith is, is I'm no better than anybody here. I just play baseball and you'll listen to me. <laughs> and really, if you think about it, I, I mean, I need Jesus. I need saving. I need spiritual counseling. I need all of the above. But because I played Major League Baseball, I actually have a forum to get up and talk. So uh, not that I figured it out, but I realized something at 26. My, my youngest son, our youngest son was, was born. And when he was born, I just had this huge wave of emotion and guilt and, and all these things. I'm like, I've been so selfish my entire life. Mm. God's been calling me to serve others. Mm -hmm. It's in the Bible. Every, every <laughs> chapter, it's in yeah, the Bible. You can't miss it. <laughs> and I've been serving myself my entire life. Huh. And even though I went to church, and even though I understand who, understood who God was, I wasn't really following Jesus Christ the way that I was supposed to. But when That's I was a pretty big admission, though. You and, yeah, and you have to be honest with yourself, yeah. right? Um, and, and Lee and I talked about it a lot, and I think one of the things that I realized was I had always been very laser focused at, at my job and, and baseball. People that know me know that like I have, you know, I, I put blinders on when I have a task and I'll finish that task no matter what. And uh, that worked for a baseball career. Mm. Didn't necessarily work for a Christian life. Mm. And what I was doing is I was putting God in a box. I was saying, okay, when I need you, God, on Sunday or when there's pain or when mm -hmm. there's hurt or whatever, I'll go to you and I'll pray and I'll, I will be a Christian godly man. But the rest of my life, baseball, boom, I was mm -hmm. on my own. You know, uh, relationships with friends, on my own. Mm -hmm. Businesses that I was involved in, on my mm -hmm. own. And I realized that when you have a child, you better bring that child to God's box. <laughs> because mm -hmm. you need him every single mm -hmm. step of the way. I mean, mm -hmm. we bring him home and it's like, what do we do now? <laughs> Let's ask God what to do. And I, that was a wake-up call for me that, you know, yeah. don't put God in the box. Mm. Um, don't go to him when you need him. Live in that box. And, and I think I've tried to do that, obviously, falter all the time. Yeah. Every day, you know, you, 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 you say something you shouldn't. You, you think something you shouldn't. But as long as you're, you have God with you, the Holy Spirit's with you at all times. Yeah. Um, and I, I think at, at 26, when Jack was born, it's like, okay, I, I'm starting to get it now. And didn't you, I, I wrote down once, we were chatting once, uh, keep Jesus as a part of everything you do. You said that several times in the conversation. Is that kind of what, this is your mantra? Yeah, in a way, you know, I, um, you've seen those uh, WWJD bracelets, what would Jesus do? And I went to college in Georgia, and they were everywhere. And I'd never <laughs> even seen one. Really, I'd never even seen one. That's all right. And, I haven't seen a lot of Princeton either. So. Yeah. And um, so I had Matthew Swain, one a walk on kid from, from South Georgia. And I said, what is that? He's like, what would Jesus do? He's like, what, would, what do you mean? What would Jesus do? It's like, this reminds me every decision I have to make. What would Jesus do? Yeah. I'm like, that's really simple. Yeah. He's like, but I'm in college and it's like, Jesus definitely wouldn't do that. So I'm going <laughs> to take it off right now. Um, but as, as you get older, as you get older and you have responsibilities and you have children and, you know, you have a wife that loves you, you don't want to let down, man, that works. Yeah, it yeah. absolutely works. And so while I don't wear one, yeah. um, I, have, I have it you know, right in my top drawer of my desk. I have, my mom used to put crucifixes all over our house. We have hmm. crucifixes everywhere. Um, and, you know, just, you just need those constant reminders that yeah. everything you're doing, yeah. God is with you. Yeah. 
and, and try to make the decisions based on God telling you what yeah. to do. Yeah. So one thing that I, I suspect might be a question in some people's minds, and, and frankly it's been in, in my mind more when I was younger than, than now, but, but the, the TV, sometimes they edit it out, but after someone makes the amazing home run, like your number 409 Grand Slam, wow, amazing. Uh, and uh, plus Jesus, I want to give thanks, the interview, I want to give thanks to my Lord and Savior Jesus. And you could tell the interviewer often feels a little awkward, sometimes it gets edited out. How do, you, how do you respond to the cynic who would say, wait, is God really supporting the Yankees? Uh, you know, how about, you know, yeah. maybe the Red Sox or whatever based on where you live. Yeah. So and I, I know we're in the edge of Red Sox territory, <laughs> so some people might have been a little uneasy all evening. But, but how, do you, how do you think about that? Because I know you pray when you play, yep. um, but, but what about this thing? Whose side is God really on? Yeah, well, God's on all of our side. You know, God does not care if the Yankees or Red Sox win. But I think, <laughs> do you want to repeat that? I, yeah. <laughs> I, I, but I think, I, I think the issue is, is um, first of all, do you mean it? Hmm. Because you can't, you can't fool God. You know, God, I saw plenty of guys playing. And I knew exactly what they were doing at nights and, you know, away from their families. And then they're doing this when they had a home run. I'm like, a little disconnect. Okay. Um, but also, listen, we live in a world where God has been taken out of everything. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you can't talk about God at, at public schools. You can't talk about God um, on, on TV. By, by the way, you might be, we were talking, uh, <laughs> Tom Gabbard was saying, there's a recent, you know, the uh, HBO series Silicon Valley, that there was a short version of a long skit they just did as a guy got outed. Uh, for being a Christian, and it ruined his career. And it's sort of like, it would have been easier yeah. if he had been outed for a sexual orientation or something That's, else. Uh, it's, sad. It's, it's sad but true, though. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, we, 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 can't, we can't be public about our, our faith. Um, so any way that you can show it, any yeah. way that you can slip it in there without being um, chastised for it, you know, I know God tells you, it's one of the things I struggle with. God tells you to always stand up for me. Yeah. I'm saying, God, I'm, I'm too weak. I can't always st stand yeah. up for you. Yeah. Um, they're, they're so, so when you do pray on the field, because in fact you were saying in, in the World Series that, that, huh. that you folks won, you said you prayed more during that game number six. Game six. I probably prayed more during game six of the World Series in 09, the, the, the <laughs> clinching game. And I had the entire season like combined. <laughs> I didn't pray a ton on the field. I wasn't a guy that prayed for myself you know, for, for, um, for success. Okay. I always said my, I said a prayer during national anthem every day. Cause I knew that during the national anthem, I had, you know, a minute to really just focus. Okay. Boom. A minute. I'm going to get my prayers in. And I know if I didn't do it in the morning or if I didn't do mm. it, um, at night, uh, because we're traveling or whatever, at the very least I was getting a minute in mm. during the national anthem. Um, but during the game, once the game started, I didn't pray for myself. I, I, I just kind of, I went out there and said, God, you know, I'm going to go do this, and whether I fail or succeed, I'm going to live with it. Um, mm. But during that game, oh, I was asking. I was asking for success <laughs> during that game. And praying for uh, Mariano to uh, yeah. bring it home, right? And, one, and once Mo came in, everything was good. It's like the prayers were answered. <laughs> that means you had a lead. <laughs> uh, so let's shift from uh, this marvelous chapter of your life, which you worked so hard at, and particularly towards the end with a lot of injuries and battling back. Uh, Tell me, what are, what are some lessons that apply? Because you're a businessman now. You're an investor. You actively, uh, you're in the juice business. Uh, you've got the uh, investment going down in Atlanta and the, the Urban Center. T talk a bit about some of the life lessons that sport and or your faith taught you about being a decent businessman. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the best thing that, I, that ever happened to me from a business standpoint is I played for the Yankees uh, because I had an eight-year internship in New York City. <laughs> and you know, honestly, you know, people think I'm joking. You I got to wear to pinstripe meet, suits. You know, the whole I got yeah. to meet the smartest, huh. most successful, most mm -hmm. talented businessmen and women in New York for the last eight years, you know, ten years. Yeah. Uh, and I was a fly on the wall. I, I kind of humbled myself. I think that's where my faith came in. I didn't go into a, a meeting at Blackstone or Goldman Sachs thinking I knew everything. I knew nothing going into those meetings. And I would be quiet. Mm -hmm. Guys would ask me funny stuff about baseball or whatever, and I'd be quiet. Mm -hmm. And they'd say, hey, Tex, you know, where are you guys going next? And I would just listen, 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 listen. Mm -hmm. And I think that humility of knowing that you don't have all the answers. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of athletes get in trouble because they, they were all-stars, they made millions of dollars, and they go into the business world and go, oh, I have all, I got this, you know. Hmm. No, wait, this really smart CEO is telling me not to buy that? Oh, forget, I, I know what I'm doing. You hmm. just lost half a million dollars on a dumb, yeah. You know, yeah. That happens all the time. Yeah. And so I think what I learned in New York was um, if you don't know 
what you're doing, like if you don't really know what you're doing, surround yourself with really smart people mm. and, and take their advice. And that's, mm. you know, your Christian faith, right? Like, hey, you need to surround yourself with other believers because yeah. you don't have all the answers. Sometimes you struggle. Sometimes you need that support. And it's, it's a, a very similar idea, uh, you know, in church or, or in business. So when you had the cameo appearance on the show Billions, which uh, some people who are in the hedge fund industry in this room might have watched, um, did, 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 your, your, did you get any an investment uh, from, from Damien as a result of uh, talking about Juice Press? No, you know what, That's, uh, that was a really funny uh, thing. David Levine, who I'm sure some of you know, lives here in Greenwich. <laughs> We, we saw each other at dinner at Harvest one night, and he's like, hey, I've been meaning to call you. I've got a perfect cameo for you. And uh, so we talked about, okay, this is what we're going to do, and we're going to be at a charity event. And this happens all the time, by the way. I'm at a charity event. A guy comes up with his son, and he's a big fan. You sign it, take a picture. The kid's got a big smile, and, it's, and, and you kind of – so I told David, I was like, this is exactly what I do. But what he had kind of written down wasn't something that I would even say. Yeah. I said, David, I need this to be real. I was like, what if we talk about juice press? What if we like, you know, and a little, little I call it guerrilla marketing, you know, throw, throw your name out there. And it's like, okay, like I'm going to get out there and, and show people who I am. But this is really me. Mm-hmm. And if I was at a charity event, I'd talk about juice press. <laughs> I'd be like, hey, hey, you should hear about this thing. It's really cool. And, you know. It's one of his investments. Right? Yeah. Um, right. Anybody that wants to go to juice press on Greenwich Avenue, it's a great place. <laughs> it's healthy. No. Uh, but, yeah, so uh, it, that was a lot of fun. And, uh, and tell me, uh, as you talk about learning from wise people and business people, Ray Dalio, his book, Principles. There's a couple of things in there that struck you as well. That, what a great book. Um, you know, so everyone has principles. Some people don't write them down, right? I mean, we all live by certain principles. And I or, they get it, or they get it on one page. <laughs> yeah. I, just, I thought it was really cool that Ray did that, and he's mm. been doing it you know, his entire business career. And what, the one thing that stuck out at me that, that I've learned about myself is you know, the meritocracy thing. And you know, know what you're good at. Know what you're good at. Surround yourself with people that compliment you. Mm. And if you think about it, it's like a baseball team. If, it was, if our entire team was first baseman, that were slow, but hit home runs, we wouldn't be that good of a team. If your entire team was little fast guys that ran around the bases, but, you know, bunted all the time, you wouldn't be very good. And so Ray's book kind of reaffirmed what I, what I thought, Mm. but yeah, this makes a lot of sense. You know, you have four or five business partners. They can't all be like you. You know, Mm. all your employees can't be type A. Mm. All your employees can't be highly emotional like you have to have a really good mix of people and ray just does a great job of laying it out and and you know in a way that you can understand it so how do you how do you figure out as you're seeking to surround yourself with smart people how do you how do you discern if they have integrity character because that's central to who you are yeah you, you have to spend time with them i mean i think that's you can't read about someone's heart or you can't read about someone's character in, in the Wall Street Journal, right? right? right. So uh, for me, it's really spending time. I call it social commerce. And mm. social commerce is playing around a golf, you know, going to a, a ball game together, um, going to dinner together, right. and really getting to know somebody. I mean, if, if, if I'm at a business dinner and people know how important my yeah, faith is. Because they're coming to you also as your image, right? You're the guy, you're the baseball yeah. star. Well, and sometimes I'm, I'm going after them. I mean, remember, I'm, we're in New York That's now. True. There's a <laughs> lot of people way more important than I am. And so, so uh, whatever the dynamic yeah. is, if I am looking at a business opportunity or, or a partner or hiring somebody, whatever it might be, and we go to dinner and the whole time he's talking about stuff that don't match up with with my values Mm -hmm. probably not a good guy to bring on might be the smartest guy in the room Mm. probably not a good guy to to bring on because at the end of the day you know there's a lot of really good people that are also smart and Mm. i'd rather find the the really good person that can get the job done you know i've heard story and i'm sure you in the room have as well story after story of business deals that looked good on the surface maybe were totally legal but the, per- the counterparty ultimately was just not fully trustable. And all those led to lots of pain, usually lawsuits, loss of money. So if you could figure out how to identify that. Yeah, that, well, that's why GLF is so important. You know, when, I, when, when Michael told me about GLF a couple years ago, I'm like, yes, that's, that's what, yeah. I mean, I wish baseball had a GLF. Um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of darkness out there. Mm. And if you can surround yourself with, with people that, that believe in the GLF mission, yeah. you know, you can start connecting dots to some, to some really good people in business. The, um, 
Uh, you mentioned playing golf, which is now a big part of your, your pleasure time. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look back at your business career these past couple of years and earlier investments you made, are there any mulligans that you have? That Absolutely. You wish you can, and any that you're willing to share? That, like, not just I, a bad business investment, but where something where there might have been an ethical component or. A, I never got involved with anything. Like, if, if something sounded too good to be true and, and could be illegal, probably is. It is. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, a good old rule, isn't it? I remember, I remember before the, 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 the Madoff days um, yeah. I was sitting in, in Dallas at the golf course and a bunch of the old guys were talking about investments and this and that and again I'm just listening I'm listening and they're like I got this guy up in New York he never loses he's up 15 to 23 percent every <laughs> year and it's like okay and I called my financial advisor and said man there's this great guy everyone's but and he's like no don't he goes yeah it, if it sounds too good to be true it's too good to be true yeah. um and I have a, you know, there's a mulligan in a, a private equity deal that I did just because I think I got greedy. I, mm. I, I think I looked at, man, this thing could be huge. And you looked at the end rather than mm. really the principles of the business. Mm. And it's like a baseball season, right? If you talk mm. about the World Series in spring training, mm -hmm. and that's all you're talking about, you're going to miss the mm. entire journey. Mm. And like, hey, congratulations, you got off to a really good start. And because you didn't prepare, because you didn't, you know, take care of yourself, whatever it might be, because you weren't focusing on the April 3rd game in Minnesota, right. you didn't get to the World Series. So I, that's a really good lesson that I learned. Yeah. There, there's an author who uh, just came out with a book uh, uh, that talks about performance, and he studied, he works with uh, high-powered executives and elite athletes, yourself. And in his research, he finds there's two kind of indicators of success. There's performance characteristics and personal characteristics. And he said that the empirically, that particularly in team sports more than individual sports, I don't know if this is true, he says it is, that it's easier to have what he calls bracketed morality. So that when you're on a team, if your sole goal is to win at all costs, that you might be more likely to slip into behaviors or make decisions or cross that line or the slippery slope uh, and cheat. Um, uh, or whatever it might be. Hmm. Having heard that for the first time as a proposition, do you, do you think that holds? Do you think there is a, uh, a mentality sometimes for, you know, we think of Lance Armstrong and others that will do anything to win because their personal characteristics aren't as high as their performance a characteristics? Absolutely. That's, I mean, that is the easiest yes that, that, <laughs> that you can ask me. I mean, unfortunately, I, I played a sport where dozens you know you know maybe hundreds of our best players took steroids yeah. and you know I, I did an interview today I do the Michael K show every Thursday they asked are you surprised that Robinson Cano got got uh mm. pop for steroids I said no I'm not surprised mm. because you know first of all you're paying me to be honest mm. so honestly I wasn't surprised mm. um because so many guys had done it you know you're you're you have an opportunity to make a whole lot of money have fame you know whatever it might be and if someone gives you something, whether it's an inside tip mm -hmm. in business, in the stock market, yeah. or gives you a pill or, or whatever it might be, and you don't have that moral compass, you're going to take it. Yeah. That's just, you know, if you care more about winning than your soul, yeah. you know, you're going to do whatever it takes to win that game. And it's, it's very difficult sometimes to talk about because I have a lot of friends yeah. that have gotten in trouble because of, of steroids. Well, and it's tricky, too, also, uh, whether it's steroids or other things, uh, uh, other modes of cheating, just to use that as one of many examples, of also, let's say you're not doing it, but you know one of your buddies is. And do you call them out? Do you take them aside and say, hey, you know, you got to cut that out? Or, or do you just keep your nose clean and, and just ignore that's, it? That's really tough, yeah. Um, it never got to the point, my good friends were never, I never had a good friend, like mm. a good friend, mm. that ever either got in trouble or I ever thought. Uh, mm. And maybe that was subconsciously. I didn't surround myself with those guys. Maybe I got lucky, yeah. but uh, that, that kind of wasn't how it worked in baseball. Mm. Like if, mm. if, if you called out a teammate or, or tried to, that would sever a relationship and he'd basically say, you're not trying to win. Mm. Cause that's, you know, you watch billions, right? What's yeah. billions all about? It's about yeah. that team trying to win. And if one guy is playing by the book, he's getting ousted. Yeah. Look at poor Spiros, <laughs> right? You guys watch? I mean, it's like, you're, you get out of here. Yeah. And how was he accepted back in? He started cheating. Yeah. Spoiler alert, sorry. <laughs> but that's, that's baseball. Yeah. You know, it, unfortunately, not everyone's doing it. Please don't get me, get me wrong. But, you know, the, the, the few guys per team that were or that still are, um, they're going to look at you and say, well, you don't care about this team. You don't want to win a World yeah. Series. And um, that's very difficult. 
Well, it's a huge thing. When I talk with my students, this question of, uh, like, you need to be loyal to your team, to your, to your company, to your, your, the group you're working with. And yet, what do you do when you encounter something that you know is, is, is foul? You know it, it's out of play and you shouldn't do it. And the moral courage to speak up against that and how do you do it uh, without, and sometimes it may cost yeah. you your career. And, and we weigh, and it's, just, um, it's very difficult, again, we weigh collateral damage, right? Mm. The collateral damage of if you work at a big Wall Street firm of somebody cheating has oh. layers that are just... So yeah, you go to your compliance officer and say, boom, 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 boom. We had it at Georgia Tech. We had a compliance officer. So if you heard of anybody that was taking money from a booster, you had to, you know, and, and that happened. I mean, yeah. you know, but in baseball, there is no compliance officer. Um, mm-hmm. and, and we could, you know, you can talk about it. There's a lot of uh, uh, morally corrupt guys yeah. in sports as well as business. Yeah. The collateral damage is less, though, in sports because it's, Usually a person, they don't take away your World Series. Yeah. They don't take away your, your franchise doesn't get moved out of New York. Yeah. But in business, you know, yeah. on Wall Street, if, if, you're, if your head guy is cheating, there are ripples throughout the entire country. Oh, yeah. No, and, and uh, pension funds and lives can be ruined. It's, it's real exactly. stakes. It's real. Well, think of education as well. Uh, the University of Michigan is just hit with what a Michigan half State. of the, Sorry, Michigan State. 18% half, of their endowment. Yeah. $500 million price tag for something which a lot of people knew were going on, yeah. I'm sure, and no one did anything. Look, I want to ask you one last question and then move us to, to wrap up. And the question is, I heard you in an interview once, uh, someone talked about you being a self-made man, and you pushed back, and you said, no, no, I'm not. And yet, I, I know a little bit about professional sports, and you worked your tail off since you were a kid. Uh, the hours, the sacrifices, the dedication, the diligence. So you you could argue, well, you were a self-made man, but you don't like that label. Why is uh, that? I do I don't not like that label at all. None of us are self-made, mm. right? I mean, I got to play baseball because God gave me an incredible gift. And if without that gift, I don't get to play, you know, Major League Baseball mm. and don't get to have the success that I have. So it's God gave me this huge gift, um, and I just worked hard. Mm. And everyone works hard, you know, or most people work hard, yeah. but they weren't given my ability to play baseball. Mm. And uh, so when people say self-made, I'm like, not even close. It is because of the grace of God and the gifts that God has given me mm. that I was able to play baseball and have the career that I had. And that, I think that's, that forms that kind of humility. Uh, we always have to stay humble, stay humble, because that humility allows you to, um, to appreciate what you have, yeah. work hard for it, um, and then knowing when it gets taken away, hey, you, you did everything you could. You had a good ride. Mm. So uh, I definitely push back on that one. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. I'm going to close, uh, uh, and we'll give Mark a round of applause, but, but you said something as, uh, I think you've said it a couple times, but you said it in, when you retired, uh, your retirement uh, speech and in a couple interviews. And I'm just going to read this, this quote. Um, you said, uh, on the field, I just want to be, you were asked, like, how were you going to reflect in your career? Uh, all these accolades and golden gloves and everything you want. On the field, I just want to be known as a switch hitter with power. I played good defense, and I played the game the right way. I played the game the right way. How about we all give a round of applause for Mark Teixeira, who's playing the game the right way. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you.